Thanks everybody for joining. This time we have Ziji Han, who will tell us about deep quantum geometry of matrices. So please, Shiji, take it away. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's actually my first time doing a virtual seminar. I think it's a great way to bring people together, but um, I cannot see you. So if you have any questions, if you're bored or confused, yeah, just interrupt me, let me know, okay? Of course, thanks. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about a recent work in collaboration with my advisor, Sean Hanno and Stanford. So um, basically we try to understand the ground or low energy states of a matrix model with uh, machine learning techniques. Um, okay, let's get started. So, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the motivations of our work. So, why, uh, why do we choose the matrix models? Because, first of all, it's a somewhat realistic yet manageable model. It has string theory realizations. It is quantum mechanical, it's not quantum field theory. So you do not have to impose any regularizations to make it well-defined. Also, however, uh, the model that we are interested in includes some limits where um, the system is exactly solvable. So we can benchmark our new marks with the analytic results. Okay. Um, and uh, trying to understand the wave function in physical systems has long been an important topic in um, like physics research. Starting from like Hatry Fock to BCS wave functions and Laughing wave functions. Um, however, trying to find the correct wave function requires much physical insight. Um, uh, the recent machine learning you know, explosion really make us think that maybe it is the right time to understand the wave function of complicated quantum systems with this kind of um, machine learning techniques. Um, I think the machine learning helps basically in two ways. First, it gives us um, wave function ansatz, basically composed of neural networks. Neural networks are known to be universal function approximators, so hopefully they can approximate any function um, to arbitrary accuracy. And another technical um, achievement is uh, the automatic differentiation frameworks, um, such as um, TensorFlow or PyTalk. It really makes finding the correct variation of wave function very easy, even with thousands of um, parameters in the wave function. And of course, um, the last but not least important um, reason that we are interested in this model is it's underlying many important physical questions such as the emergence of locality or the unitarity of black hole dynamics that I believe many of you may be interested in as well. Okay, so um, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to uh, briefly introdu introduce the model that we're interested in. So it's um, a matrix quantum mechanics called mini BMN. Okay, so physically, um, I'm not a string theory uh, expert, but uh, I think it will be helpful to um, first tell you a little bit about a physical picture of this model. So basically it describes and deep particles in ADS4, um, which is a flux uh, um, compactification of the string theory. There is one dimensionless parameter new in our model. It is um, basically proportional to the fluxes in ADS4. Okay, so when the flux, when the flux is large, the new is large, and the ADS radius is small. And we know that gravitational back reaction becomes important when n over a new cube is um, much less, much greater than one. So basically, when nu is large, the fluxes are strong, and we're in a photosphere phase. 
where the, the particles are polarized into um, spheres. But when nu is small, the gravitation, gravitational force wins um, and the, the particles collapse. Uh, I think the small nu limit is the limit where the holography really works. Um, but in this talk, we will be interested mostly in the large nu limit where there is a fuzzy sphere and exactly solvable. And uh, we'll later see that how our numerics compare with our numeric, uh, our analytic understandings. Okay, so um, here is the definition of our model. It's a model of three bosonic um, Hermitian matrices with two fermionic matrices. So it's a supersymmetric theory. Um, and to connect with the D particle picture I just told you just now, just um, imagine that we turn off the new, so set new to zero, and consider the um, classical limit of this model. So in that case, the only term in the Hamiltonian is this bosonic potential, which is the commutative square of matrices. So if we minimize this potential, then we will get commuting bosonic matrices and we can diagonalize them um, together. So after we diagonalize all the matrices, the three matrices, the eigenvalues x1i to xni basically labels the positions um, of these n particles in ADS4. And for the quantum Hamiltonian, there may be quantum fluctuations such as the matrices do not necessarily commute. And there will be some off diagonal modes, y, 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 i, 1, 2, y, 1, n. And if you write down the um, bosonic potential, the commuted squared in, in this um, form, you will get a potential for the off diagonal modes. So basically, these off diagonal modes are the strings connecting the um, D particles. And when the eigenvalues, when the D particles are far apart, the strings become heavy um, and they're almost on their ground state. Okay, so um, this is the connection of this matrix model to the uh, D zero brain particle picture I just told you. Um, any questions about our model, the mini BMN? Um, I think we're good. Okay. So as I said just now, um, this is a supersymmetric Hamiltonian with four real superchargers and uh, U1R charge. The theory is a gauge theory. We see SU and gauge symmetry um, acting as uh, a joint in all matrices. Also, the model has SO3, global symmetry, where the bosonic matrices are vectors and the uh, harmonic matrices are spinners. Um, so, yeah, now we try to understand a special limit of this theory when nu is large. So the fluxes wings over the gravitational force and the deep rings are polarized into a sphere. Okay, so in this limit, we can write the bosonic potential as a square. And if we minimize this potential classically, we will get a representation of the SO3 or SU2, a Lie algebra. So, um, this tells us that classically, uh, the solution or the ground state of these matrices is described by three matrices um, in the representation of the SU2 algebra. So um, this SU2 algebra will become the, the symmetry, the SO3 generators of the emergent sphere. So to be more precise, um, we want to map any matrix to a field on the sphere. And we want to preserve as many structures as possible. For example, we want to say that the map should be 
um, linear, the map should preserve in the product. The map should preserve the SU2 action. Also, it should um, map uh, matrix products to uh, function products. But function products are cumulative, but matrix products are not. So basically, there are some subleading terms. And this defines a non-cumulative star product for the functions on a sphere. So, so can, can you explain what the physical uh, origin of uh, this connection? Oh, between the a sphere and the matrix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so it basically comes from this SO3 algebra. So we want to think this um, commutator with Xi's as the SO3 generators for the spheres. Or you can think of it as in the string theory case, you turn on a fluxes and the D particles are polarized into a sphere. Okay. Um, yes, so if you, uh, want to preserve such uh, these structures, there's basically a unique way to do the map. Uh, you map um, a matrix harmonic, uh, matrix spherical harmonics to uh, spherical harmonic functions. And using this map, we can really compute something about our model. For example, um, if we want to compute the radius of the sphere, it's basically sum of x squared. So, and with this mapping, this line, we know that it must be the trace of uh, the matrix squared. And a, this is the Casimir for the representation of SU2. So um, this tells us the radius of the sphere. So if we accept this kind of correspondence, mm -hmm. we can see that our theory in the large new limit is really a non-commutative U1 gauge theory on a sphere. Um, we can expand our matrices around our classical solutions. And uh, we will see that the resulting theory, after you do the mapping from matrices to a field on a sphere, it's a uh, quantum field theory, looks like a U1 gauge theory on a sphere. OK. so. Um, the only subtlety is the matrix has finite size, it's n by n. So correspondingly for the fields on a sphere, they have angular momentum cutoff. The angular momentum of these fields must be less than n. So that's why they are called body sphere. So you can imagine there are only like n points on the sphere for finite n. So this makes the geometry a little bit fuzzy. Um, Otherwise, it's a U1 gauge theory on a sphere when n is large. And the U1 gauge symmetry basically comes from the SUN gauge theory, a gauge symmetry of the original model. Um, just to recap, so we have a supersymmetric metric quantum mechanics with a SUN gauge symmetry. And in the limit where nu becomes large, there's the emergent sphere with non-commutative U1 gauge theory under the correspondence between matrices and the fields on the sphere. So the finite size of the matrices corresponds to an uh, angular momentum cutoff of the fields on the sphere. Um, so, uh let me, let me, sorry, let me shortly ask, uh, do you want to consider this model as a, as a toy model for something or more physical or, or is it um, yeah, yeah. a limit for, for, of something? So, so this model is believed to have some string theory realizations um, as D particles in a flux compactification to ADS4. And this correspond, this duality has passed several consistency checks. So we, uh, we really believe that um, it relates to the true ADS-CFT-like holography. So it's a realistic model, I think. Thank you.
and what, what, what does MINI uh, stand for? Uh, it's, it's a minimal one, or you can, in the sense that you can complicate it, or? Uh, you mean the MINI? The yeah, yeah. MINI of the name? Yeah. So there is a B, so in the original BMN models, um, so there, there is a BMN model with more matrices. Oh, okay. So this one is called a mini BMN because it, uh, it has a smaller super symmetry algebra. So it has less matrices, but gives you similar um, physics. I see. So it's called a mini BMN. And we, we use mini, we can study BMN as well, but uh, mini BMN is easier to start with because the matrices are, um, there are fewer matrices. Sure, sure, sure. No, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, now um, we can get to the second part. It's, uh, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the numerical details of um, uh, our machine learning things. So the, the, the basic pipeline of our numerics is variational Monte Carlo. So it involves four basic components. The first, the first step, of course, is to devise a, a variational wave function parametrized by some parameters. And then we have to evaluate the expectation value of energy in this um, uh, variational wave function. And the, the third step is to take the gradient of the energy with respect to those parameters. And finally, we apply, we update the parameters with these gradients. So hopefully after each update, the energy of the state goes lower. Okay, so that's the, um, the, the rough workflow of our numerics. So um, let me start from step two because it's, it's the simplest. The step two, given a wave function psi, how do we evaluate the expectation value of energy? Okay, so um, for the bosonic potential, it's actually quite simple. We can just uh, sample a bunch of uh, matrices from the wave function and uh, take the average of their um, energy as the final value. So the expectation value here basically is the integral with a measure a wave function norm squared. Okay, so this one is uh, easy. Um, the next one involves some connected terms. So it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's still manageable. So we take out uh, um, uh, Psi x squared to make it uh, expectation value. So in the bracket, it's now partial log, log of the wave function over the matrix coordinates. Okay, in similar ways, we can write all the terms in the Hamiltonian in terms of the expectation value of some function. Then we sample from our wave function and take the average of those values to estimate the um, energy of our state. So that's um, basically what we do in step two. Uh, any questions? No? I think it's clear. Okay. Um, step three is to take the gradient. So um, it's a little bit subtle. So it may be more than what you expect. So the, the energy, as I said, is the expectation value of some function, which I call the energy density. Okay, so it's the expectation value of the energy density. But when you take the gradient, um, oh, sorry. When you take the gradient, not only we have to take the gradient inside the energy density, there will also be an additional term because the probability distribution which the matrices are sampled from also depends on the parameter theta, okay? So this, uh, additional term basically comes from taking the gradient of this measure factor of um, wave function norm squared. So you will get uh, this term. And uh, this is not the final form of our gradient yet. For example, if we, sh we can imagine if we shift 
the energy of the system by a constant, uh, then nothing should change, right? Because it should only shift E theta by a constant. <coughs> um, the, the first term is okay, but when you shift the second term by a constant, you will see that there will be an additional term proportional to the gradient of log the sign. Okay, that's okay inside the expectation value, but he, it means the variance of this term in the bracket can be very large. To decrease the um, variance, uh, there's a um, common trick in reinforcement, in reinforcement learning. Basically, you subtract off the average value for the energy. Okay, so, so this term, the second term here, is the same as this term, but this term now has lower variance. It basically encourages the wave function to places where the energy is below the average. Um, yeah, um, is it clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, an another problem with this formula is that it requires that the wave function to be normalized. Okay, so but in numerics, it's really hard to normalize a wave function because we do not know its expression and, we, and it's hard to do the integral over the full um, phase space. So we want to let the wave function not necessarily normalize. And we can write the second term, this term, in this form as well. So finally, what we'll get is a formula for any not necessarily normalized wave function a way to evaluate its energy and its gradient um, in terms of the samples from the wave function. Um, so basically what we need Sorry. is revenue. Hmm? A, a, good, a good question because I, I, I didn't see what, what happened, but uh, what was the transition from normalized to unnormalized wave functions? Uh... Um, yeah, so, so this one only applies for normalized wave function, okay? Then right. for example, we can think about a function where there is, there is overall normalization factor, the theta. Okay, that doesn't depend on x, but could depend on theta. Yeah. Right? Um, but this, this expectation value is actually the same as this one. Um, because, because, because of this. So the, the expectation value with the gradient of z you can pull the gradient of z out because it doesn't depend on x. Oh, I see. And this is zero because e is precisely the expectation value of epsilon. So basically you're saying that the second term works also for unnormalized uh, wave yes. function? Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. But the first term doesn't, right? Um, um, so there is no psi here in the bracket. So if there is some way you can sample the uh, matrices from the normalized probability distribution, that will be okay. Oh, okay, 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 thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically what we need, there are two things that we need, is first to sample from the normalized wave function, okay, to e evaluate the expectation value. Um, and uh, another thing that we need is to evaluate this gradient of the log wave function. So to summarize the two things we need, we need to efficiently sample and evaluate the wave function norm squared. And this suggests that um, the generative flows, which I will introduce shortly, um, is a good candidate for this task. Um, but I'm not claiming that this is the only or the best way to do the numerics but it's a convenient way and it works. So uh, another, another nice question. So is your wave function uh, real or it's complex in general? Yeah, it's complex oh. in general. Okay. okay. Uh, before introducing the generative flows, let me make sure that we're on the same page. Um, um, I briefly mentioned the basic block, building blocks of our neural networks, which are called fully connected neural networks. So it's basically an um, efficient way of parametrizing complicated um, functions from vectors to vectors. 
Okay, so the function works um, in this way. Um, it applies, it's a concatenation of several functions. First, it's an affine transformation. Um, and then it's a nonlinear function acting on the vector element-wise. And you repeat this for several steps. And in the end, you will get a network that looks somewhat similar to the figure below. You apply the affine transformation, apply the nonlinearity, and apply the affine transformation again and keep going. And in this case, we have four layers, four affine transformations. And this gives you a um, nonlinear complicated function uh, in the end, parametrized by those weights in the affine transformations. Okay. So this, um, um, is it clear? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the generative flows now. So we use two types of generative flows. Basically it's a machine learning architecture to efficiently sample and evaluate probability distributions. Okay. The first one is called the normalizing flows. Uh, the way it works is actually quite simple. So to sample from a complicated probability distribution, we sample from a simple distribution first. Okay, so X follows a simple probability distribution, let's say a product of Gaussians. And then we apply a reversible but otherwise complicated transformation to map it to a, another random variable Y. Then the random variable Y could follow a very complicated distribution and the probability is given by the probability of X over the Jacobian um, of the transformation. Okay, um, so uh, the only question is then how do we parametrize reversible transformations? It's basically similar to the fully connected neural networks, but for the um, affine transformations, we have to make it uh, reversible. So we make the diagonal elements all positive and the lower triangle to be zero. Okay, so in this way, this affine transformation is guaranteed to be uh, reversible and we can compute it Jacobian quite easily. So this is um, the first way to do generative flows. To sample, we sample from X, apply the transformation, and to evaluate the probability, we use this formula. So sh shall I think about these X1, X2, X3, X4, Y, and Ys as thetas, basically? Yes, these are the variational parameters in our wave function. And, 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 and earlier I asked a question about the imaginary part of the wave function. So I understand that the, the potential is gonna depend on the absolute value of the wave function squared, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is a proper, I mean, for, for this, we just sample probability distribution, but the, the other term uh, doesn't it depend on the, I mean, the kinetic term depends on the derivative of the wave function, right? So it might depend on the imaginary part of the wave function, basically on the, on the phase, right? Um, yes, yeah, that's what um, I mentioned previously. Let's see. Yeah, here is the connector. So yeah, it's yeah. a derivative norm squared. Okay, okay. Right, okay. you pull, pull out a uh, density of the wave function. Yeah. This gives you log squared. Okay. I see. And I see. this is the expectation value. Okay, so this, this is the expectation value. Oh, maybe I'm jumping ahead because I, I was just wondering how you're going to model the second term, but uh, probably you're going to tell us this later. Uh, sorry, what? Uh, say it again? Because I understand that you, you want to sample psi, psi absolute value squared for, as a probability mm -hmm. distribution. Yes. Then we also want to sample now log, the derivative of the log of psi, right? Uh, no, we only sample from psi. Oh, you only sample? Sorry. Yeah, but when we evaluate the average, for each sample, we evaluate the gradient of the log wave function and I take the average. Okay. But the only thing that we need is to sample from norm squared. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Okay.
Uh, yeah, that's the first uh, generative flow architecture that we'll use. The second one, the second one is called masked autoregressive flows. It's a little bit more complicated and it, re it requires an ordering of the components of your vector. Okay, let's say we order it in, in the order x1, x2, and to xn. Um, for the first random variable, we just sample it from uh, um, uh, some probability distribution. But for the second one, we sample it from a probability distribution that may depend on the first variable. Okay, so for the ith variable, the, prob the probability distribution can actually depend on the, all the components before it. Okay, so in this way, the joint probability distribution is actually can be quite complicated. It's a product of this um, probability distributions. So um, in this way, we can sample and evaluate quite efficiently. So, so um, this is the second architecture that we will use for the quantum Monte Carlo. Okay, is that clear? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Great. Now, now we come to yeah, it's 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 um. Now we come to the most complicated part is our wave function ensembles. So there are basically two subtleties. The first thing is our wave function should be gauge invariant because our model is uh, is SU and gauge theory. And then the second thing is. Um, there are fermions, so we have to parameterize fermionic states somehow. So first, for gauge invariance, basically we think the wave function as function from bosonic matrices to fermionic states. Okay, that will be um, how we represent the state um, in our paper. Then the SU gauge invariance basically becomes the equivariance of this psi. Um, yeah, so here is the requirement for the gauge invariance. And to make sure that the wave function is gauge invariant, a simple way to do is just to fix a gauge. Okay, we um, fix a gauge, pick a gauge representative for any matrix. We do a gauge transformation to make it in the, in the gauge that we picked. Okay, and we undo the, uh, the transformation to get the wave function. In this way, we make sure that the wave function is um, gauge invariant. Yeah, now it comes to the bosons. So that's basically a combination of what we discussed just now, is one, how to impose gauge invariance. Yeah, and another thing is how to use generative flows. Okay, so the procedure is actually not so complicated. We first sample gauge orbits. Then we sample a random gauge element. We apply the gauge element to the gauge orbits. We get, get our sample for the bosonic matrices. And we have a expression for the probability distribution that this X um, follows. So there's additional term basically come from the Jacobian when you change from the matrix, or matrix coordinates to gauge orbits because different gauge orbits have different sizes. So there's additional Jacobian factor. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, any questions? No. Okay. Uh, so any, any gauge will work, of course as long as it's simple to do the gauge fixing and it's uh, easy to evaluate the, the Jacobian factor. Oh, that's basically for the bosons. For the fermions, we parameterized our state by a superposition of free fermion states. Okay, I know that uh, this may not be the best thing to do, but uh, um, yeah, that's what we did in our paper. So, so this, this lambda dagger are the fermionic creation operators for the matrices of fermions. This zero is the state without any fermions. Um, then this expression 
in the in the bracket is basically a one fermion creation operator parametrized by this um, m. You take the product of r um, fermion creation operators to give you a r fermion state, and you do a sum to make it a superposition of r fermion states. So in principle, if you have arbitrarily large d, then any uh, fermionic wave function can be approximated accurately. But in practice, we will take d to like four, for example, and the state is basically a superposition of four free fermion states. Um, but this fermion states can of course depend on x, and its dependence is parametrized by a fully connected um, neural network. Yes, so that's how we um, parametrize our fermions because this, the the model is supersymmetric. So to make it work, we must have an efficient way of doing fermions as well. So to recap, um, variation Monte Carlo requires that we can sample and evaluate the wave function efficiently. Um, and to sample a uh, gauge invariant wave function, we sample from gauge orbits and do a random group action. And to evaluate the wave function, we first do a gauge fixing and evaluate the norm and the, the fermionic states uh, using generative flows and um, um, a, a fully connected neural network. So that's how our, we implemented our um, wave function. Um, any questions? Not at the moment, it seems. Okay, so now is it, um, uh, yes, the fun part. We can see the results of our uh, machine learning. Um, so there are several <coughs> solvable cases where we can benchmark um, our numerics. The simplest case is when n is two. So that means the matrices are um, two by two. So they're quite small and can be the differential equation, the, the Schrodinger equation can be solved numerically um, in sectors with fixed angular momentum J and uh, fixed number of fermions. So for this plot, there, it's bosonic, there are no fermions. Um, and the, the, the dashed curve is basically the exact value that people got um, in previous papers. And the, the, these markers are the results produced by um, our architecture of different kinds of generative flows with different number of layers, etc. So we can see that even for, for one layer, for one layer of masked autoregressive flow, it actually produces um, quite reasonable result. It's very close to the um, exact value uh, in this bosonic case. Do you understand why why uh, th there is some discrepancy growing in the direction of um, what of uh, zero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So. In, in the case with large new, as I said, it's a limit where it's exactly solvable. So in that limit, the wave function is basically a Gaussian. Oh, okay. So which can be, well, it's, it can be exactly parametrized by our um, neural network. So in that limit, it it's works better. Okay. Yeah, so this is the bosonic sector. And this is the supersymmetric um, sector with two fermions. So when u is zero, uh, it is uh, conjectured, uh, there con is conjectured to be a supersymmetric ground state. So that's the dashed line with energy zero. Okay. Um, and we see some discrepancies here. So you can see that actually increasing the number of layers improve the results. So the wave function here is more 
bit more complicated. But up there, it's still cl close to the, um, to the exact value. Okay, you may say, okay, so, so this markers may look a little bit lower than the exact value, but um, um, our variation of Monte Carlo have some uncertainties and the arrow bars, the uncertainties of these markers are basically on the scale of these markers. So this discrepancy um, is within the um, arrow bars of these markers. So we see that both in the bosonic and supersymmetric case, our neural network agrees with exact values um, quite well. Sorry, C can you give us a rough estimate of the evaluation time for, for these points, for the different numbers of layers? Yes, for n equals two, it's actually quite fast. It's like um, on the scale of hours, one hour, two hours on my laptop for, for each point. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So the second um, exactly solvable case is when U is large. As I said, there is an emergent phase sphere with a uh, non commutative U1 gauge theory on the sphere. In that case, the theory is exactly solvable by the correspondence between matrices and the fields I discussed previously. And uh, for the bottomic case, r equals zero, um, we find a first order phase transition at new approximately three. Okay, so this is an analytic result. So we, we see that um, when new is large, there is a metal stable state at the fatty sphere configuration, and there is also a minimum at the zero radius. But when new is small, the fuzzy sphere configuration is no longer um, stable. So this is our analytic, analytic understanding. And we see that in numerics as well. So when we do the numerics, when u is large, um, it finds out the, 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 the fuzzy sphere. But when u becomes small, it's approximately four, it stops to be stable and uh, collapses. So um, yeah, it's in spirit, like the, here the gravitation is more important. It wings over the fluxes and the, uh, the, 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 the debris collapses. Otherwise, so the, the, the dashed lines are the exact value, uh, the semi-classical values, the analytic values. Um, and it agrees with uh, numerics. So this takes a little bit longer time because n is large. So um, basically our algorithm scales as uh, n to the power of three or n to the power of four, depending on your architecture. So this takes longer time, but it's also on the scale of one or two days, okay, for each point. Um, this is the radius of the fuzzy sphere, and this is energy for the fuzzy sphere in the bosonic case. Uh, and we can also see uh, the probability distribution of the radius. So R not R not is a semi-classical value. When u is large, the sphere is the radius of the sphere is basically peaked at the um, semi-classical value and that there are some quantum fluctuations around that value. Um, this is from our numerics at n equals um, eight, I think. So in the bottleneck case, it, um, it seems to be work quite well. Now we turn to the supersymmetric sector where there are uh, um, so, some fermions. One question about the previous plot. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, like yet, yet the previous one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so regarding this jump, like, would you say that uh, the method that you employ works better than other existing results on predicting the, the phase position? Um, actually, I'm not aware of any uh, results uh, 
reproducing this um, first order phase transition in a quantum mechanical model. So, because you know, with fermions, oh, okay, so this one is without fermions. So, without fermions, people can do uh, Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo, for example, and they can find a similar phase transition. I see, I see. But, but our result only, but uh, when you have fermions, you cannot really do the quantum Monte Carlo because of the same problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, but our method can be applied to fermions as well. I see, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Um, so with fermions, we can do similar analysis. We see that the phase sphere has zero energy to, to the first order in the semi-classical limit. And there is no first, for first order phase transition. And indeed, we, we do not observe first order phase transitions um, with fermions. So it goes smoothly to a smaller radius. Um, and the energy, the energy are almost zero within the numerical resolution. So this, this empty circles, they are initialized near the zero radius configuration and this um, solid dots, they are initialized near fuzzy spheres. So these are the fuzzy sphere configurations, these are the uh, zero radius configurations and uh, um, there is a crossover that they merge smoothly when you is small. Okay, any any questions about um, about the supersymmetry case? Yeah, I, I just had a question about the graph. So the one comma one, it's one affine transformation and and one. Um, yeah, yeah it it means in each generative flow, there uh -huh. is only one hidden layer. So there are two layers, um, it's one hidden layer. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so we, we just saw that from an observable perspective, uh, the radius and the energy um, of our numerics agrees quite well with our semi-classical analysis. And another thing that we did in our paper is trying to understand the entanglement structure of the ground state of these wave functions. Because we now have the wave function, we can really compute some quantum mechanical properties like entanglement, um, for example. So, so when you, you, when you, sorry, when, when you talk about entanglement, you mean the picture on a, on a, on a sphere of, uh, of a gauge field on a sphere? Or? Yes. OK. okay. So it's the entanglement of the non-cumulative gauge theory on a sphere, on a fuzzy sphere. Um, um, so the idea is that when you map matrices to spheres, basically the finite size of the matrices becomes a cutoff of the um, fields on a sphere. So it's angular momentum cutoff, such that the fields must have angular momentum j less than N um, on a sphere. So we started with the, I, uh, I want to start with a simple example of how to e evaluate entanglement for free, free fields with uh, angular momentum cutoff. Okay. Um, so in that case, to evaluate an entanglement, we need a tensor product structure of our Hilbert space. So for a quantum field theory, we can decompose the space of all the fields um, into a dark sum decomposition. And then the physical Hilbert space, which is the space of wave functionals on this field, then have a tensor product structure. Okay, so, so that means to define a tensor product decomposition of the Hilbert space, we need a projection operator on the field space. So without any angular momentum cutoff, this projector, actually it's quite easy to um, construct. You just restrict the function to the regions on the sphere that you care about. But unfortunately, this does not commute with a restriction to, um, uh, with the cutoff of the angular momentum. 
So our approach is that now we have a true projector and we have a restriction of angular momentum. But when you restrict to this, uh, this block in this projector, the restricted matrix is no longer a projection matrix. Uh, the way we deal with this problem is to find the projector that's closest to this restriction to the sector of finite um, angular momentum. And uh, after that, we can use that to define a partition of the Hilbert space. So uh, do you eventually want to take like an uh, infinite size limit or, or is it uh, for physical, uh, as some physical states not necessary to have like infinite angular momentum? Um, so uh, for our matrix model to be dual to continuous geometry, we needed the size of the matrix N goes to infinite. That corresponds to this J max goes to infinite. So we are interested in the limit where the cutoff is goes to infinite. It's very high. Okay, so here is the numerical is a dot for, for free fields with uh, angular momentum cutoff, just to illustrate our procedure. Okay, so this uh, we consider a polar cap on a sphere, and this theta a is the angle of the polar cap. And we can evaluate the second ring entropy um, from the partition I just defined. And indeed, we find an area law of entanglement. Uh, the entanglement is proportional to the cutoff, J max, and it's proportional to the boundary of the polar cap, which is 2 pi sine theta. So indeed, from the procedure I just described, we can have an error law of entanglement that diverges as the cutoff goes to um, infinite. So this is for free field on, um, with angular momentum cutoff. But it's basically the same as the non-cumulative gauge theory on a fuzzy sphere up to um, gauge subtleties. So this is the result that we have for the um, non-cumulative gauge theory on a fuzzy sphere. So still you can see that uh, it's kind of error law and it's not, not very smooth because there is a cutoff. So uh, actually it cannot resolve very small angles. So it's not very smooth. Um, but otherwise um, it agrees with the, so the, the solid lines are the semi-classical values for the entanglement and the dots are what we get from our variational wave function. So, so from a... Uh, what, what do you mean by semi-classical here? So when nu is infinite, the theory is solvable. Um, of course, the entanglement can be evaluated exactly as well. So these solid lines are for, for oh. the entanglement at nu equals infinity. So this is the Gaussian, this is the, this is the Gaussian. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, it's the Gaussian. Um, and N is still finite, but the new is infinite. Mm -hmm. The dots are from the variation of Monte Carlo for finite new. So, so basically we should think about the solid line as, 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 as basically an exact result. Yeah, it's an exact result at, uh, in the limit of infinite new. So, so basically you're saying that like these, these uh, sharp uh, features mm -hmm. are, are physical. Um, yes, but this sharp, the scale of these sharp features are small compared to the overall scale of the um, entropy. So if N is very large, I would expect the curve becomes very smooth. So okay. these are for finite n. So you see this kind of um, giggles. I see, I see, I see. When n is very large, the, the entropy diverges and these fluctuations should be very small. Oh, sorry, what yeah. happened? So, so, so one, one more question. So, uh, but, but that, that might be obvious. Uh, so, so, so in, in holography, right, for, so as far as I understand, like what you have here is our results uh, for um, 
the Gaussian calculation and for uh, Monte Carlo calculation or for, for a neural network calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, is, can, can one think about some, some sort of a Yuta Kayanagi uh, prescription for calculating the, the, the entanglement entropy in, this, in, the, in, the, in the matrix model? Yeah, that's what we're thinking about as well. But uh, it's a little bit subtle because this limit, the funny, um, um, we don't really have an RT formula for this limit, for the Fadi spheres. But um, because what, what I would like to think is that, you know, like there's this, this gauge theory on, on, a, on the Fadi sphere, mm -hmm. and then you can calculate the entire entropy in it, like taking, setting aside the, all, all sorts of subtleties related to the gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. and pro possibly non competitivity because I, I, I know little about it. And then like there should be a prescription to calculate the same quantity using the matrix model. And then maybe there is like, a, you know, some, some, some realization of the Rita Kanagi in, in this context. Yes, yeah, I, there were some papers on this actually. But, oh, okay. uh, but, but, but um, the problem is actually very subtle because first of all, it's a gauge theory. And uh, it's all a non commutative geometry. Um, so I don't think there's agreement on how, how the prescription works That's for nice. entanglement on such a geometry. Okay, so, so this is our prescription. It seems to give you error law, but there are other prescriptions that people propose that can give you other, other laws, like volume laws. Um, so I would say that it's still an uh, open problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so that's basically what um, I hope that to uh, tell you today that we, we think it is possible and to discover the low energy or ground states of matrix models uh, with deep learning. And hopefully this will help, help us uh, understand better holography. Um, actually, recently we're, we are more interested in the limit where nu is small. So that's the limit where the deep particles collapse and the gravitation is more important. So hopefully that's the limit more closely connected to um, holography. But uh, we are still trying to think about what are appropriate wave function ansatz in that limit. Okay, so that's basically what we did for the matrix model. Secondly, we also propose a way of defining entanglement on non commutative geometries. And we hope that we may generalize this to other models as well. Um, and finally, please um, check out our paper for more references. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we've already had a few questions. Uh, does anybody have another uh, question? People joining online maybe? So, so the, the, the bottleneck of, of bot the, the bottleneck for, for uh, these considerations were like the size of the matrices, right? Like for, for this machine learning exercise. You had like uh, relatively small matrix sizes in order to be able to execute this calculation, right? Um, yes, but we believe that we can go to a size like 20 or 30 if we have more computational power and uh, a longer time. So I think uh, 20 to 30 are uh, uh, doable. Is, is it the, is, and, and what, what then did you mean about uh, the interesting limit of emergent gravity that requires more insight? Yeah, so there are um, two major problems. Is first, although, although machine learning helps us finding the correct wave function, the, the form of the wave function is actually still very important. We have to impose, for example, what's the probability distribution to start with. So in the limit where nu is small, we are not sure 
what is the most convenient way of parameterizing the wave function? So that's the first question. So in the fuzzy sphere limit, because we know the exact wave function, we know that if we can parameterize Gaussians, then we should be good in that limit. But when u is small, we are not sure what are the uh, most relevant variables. That's the first um, thing. And the second thing is, uh, even with, if we have a wave function of the ground state, um, how do we see a emergent geometry? For example, how do we extract, for example, the metric um, from, from our wave function? Um, can we see gravity in that limit? Um, yeah, so these are the problems that we're thinking about right now. I see, I see, I see. So basically, it's a matter of the variational answers. It's a matter of the answers for the for the probability distribution, basically. Yes, and how to interpret the results. Yeah, yeah. And 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 last question on my side, and I I should have. Uh, so 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 you had like uh, two different. I mean, I remember you had like a situation in which your system was described by by a Gaussian state, right? And you had this limit of mu going to zero. That was interesting, right? Do you see some interesting change in the behavior of um, uh, various nodes in the neural net, uh, depending on what's the value of mu? Um, yes, so for example, we can still plot the, this distribution of the radius of the, of the matrices, okay? So in the fuzzy sphere case, there are just two peaks. The radius just peaks around the, the semi-classical value. But after the phase transition to the small new phase, we see that the radius is basically close to the zero and it's not Gaussian. Um, so these particles collapse to a state where it's not Gaussian, but we are not sure what it is. I see, I see. And, and given what, what, we, what we talked about uh, when it comes to parameterizing the distribution, uh, the, the probability distribution, uh, you nevertheless trust these results or you just uh, take them as a blind prediction for, for, for mu equal, zero, equal to zero. Yeah, we, we, we didn't benchmark in that limit. So I'm not sure, yeah, um, uh, how it works in that limit. That's what we are working on now. I see, I see, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, if not, then let's thank Shiji again. Well, thank you.